okay let's start in the last uh, couple of classes we have been looking at how to uh, characterize the performance of an adc and we decided that we uh, measure it through the signal to noise ratio and for that we apply a sinusoidal signal to our adc and measure the pass spectral density and do it and in the last class we saw how do how do we choose the frequency for this sinusoid so first we choose the number of points for the dft and if fs is your sampling rate how will you choose the input frequency it is of the form m by n times fs where these two guys are co prime right and uh, in the last class uh, i also mentioned that in practice along with noise you'll also have uh, nonlinearity so if you apply a sinusoid at a frequency f not at the output you'll see all its harmonics also and to capture that we measure the signal to noise and distortion ratio sndr and then you back calculate the effective number of bits from that <coughs> right <coughs> so uh, now we'll see how uh, with in presence of nonlinearity we'll see how the characteristics of this quantizer or the adc is going to look like and uh, you know that if there is no nonlinearity that is if the output is just the input plus some noise which could be both quantization noise and uh, circuit thermal noise we we'll have a nice staircase characteristics like this right and this is the characteristics so in the x axis i am plotting the input y so let's say it's spanning from uh, minus 1 volt to plus 1 volt in the y axis i am plotting the output codes starting from 0 to 7 8 level quantizer <coughs> right and this is the staircase characteristics in hello so we can approximate this as these some y plus some q and basically you can uh, draw a straight line i mean if you get a if you try to fit it through a straight line you will get a nice uh, line of the form v equal to y right and that's why it's linear and the other thing to notice uh, what is the step size here sorry i mean if you want where to find a straight line for the blue it is ah oh, okay fine i mean this is because it's output code so let's say it's some offset but it's a straight line okay so uh, what is the ideal code width or the step size here we have a span minus 1 to 1 divided into 8 so we have 1 by 4 or 0.25 okay and you notice that for each of these codes the code width or the step size is same so if i call this as delta 1 code width of code 1 this is delta 2 for code 2 and so on all of them are equal and equal to the ideal step size i will say which is 0.25 0.5 volts and also these voltages this is basically minus 0.75 volt this is minus 0.25 volts and so on so these are the uh, transition voltages so this i'll call as v1 it is a transition voltage corresponding to code 1 okay similarly this is say v2 v3 v4 and so on okay great and note that for a particular code say code 3 this code width or the step size for the particular code what is it in terms of the transition voltage is let's say you take some particular code here say delta 3 in terms of the transition voltage is what is it it's v4 minus v3 so in general delta k is what vk plus 1 minus vk fine it is just the difference between the two successive transition voltages and if i were to write the uh, k th transition voltage in terms of the code k and the uh, code width or the step size delta what will it be i mean note that for the uh, fourth code the transition voltage is zero right and all these guys are spaced in uh, spaced at delta or the ideal oops 
right this is i delta ideal okay so what is it now vk in terms of delta and k it is a simple straight i mean uh, straight line equation in terms of everything is given right i mean for a uh, code for i mean for the fourth code what is the transition voltage zero for the fifth code what is the transition voltage it is delta ah k minus 4 times delta okay i mean this is for in this eight level quantizer the transition voltage is go as k minus 4 delta okay now again this there is no non linearity here that's why you can uh, fit a straight line through it the other way to think is if basically if you try to join all the transition voltages here you will get a nice straight line okay now if the uh, adc has non linearity if i uh, and, and if i try to do the same thing try to uh, you know join all the transition voltage do you think we'll get a straight line or something else we we'll obviously not get a straight line so we'll get some non linear characteristics like this and let's say these are the different codes so the transition voltage is will lie somewhere here okay so if you try to get the step characteristics it will look something like this okay so uh, if there is non linearity you will have the transition voltage is to be different deviating from the ideal values and not just that the code width or the step size for each code that's going to be different okay so uh, this is an example where i'm showing such non linear characteristic so the one in gray uh, that is the ideal characteristics okay and the one in blue is the one with non linearity okay and uh, to characterize this non linearity uh, we have decided to look at the signal to noise and distortion ratio sndr wherein you apply a sinusoid and look at the you know noise plus distortion components but in uh, many cases uh, we might be interested in the static performance of the adc that is uh, we are looking at the dc performance where the signal of interest is dc we are supposed to digitize dc signals so in that case if you follow the same procedure you might apply a dc look at the spectrum for a dc signal where will the harmonics lie zero right same we can't distinguish the signal from the harmonics so we can't do that way for characterizing the static non linearity we cannot look at the frequency spectrum to distinguish the signal from the harmonics so in those cases the only way to describe the non linearity is to say how the characteristics of my quantizer is deviating from the ideal characteristics okay so this is the ideal characteristics we'll try to uh, explain how it deviates from the ideal characteristics right because we can't do it in time domain i mean frequency domain okay so now uh, let us say you want to describe this uh, quantizer characteristics that is in correct correct if you apply uh, i mean let's say you look at in the frequency spectrum right all the harmonics of the dc will also be at dc right we can't distinguish the signal from its harmonics so we can't do it in the frequency domain but we are looking at the dc performance for dc signals how is it is it linear or not what is harmonic for dc that's what right it's same dc what is distortion but see if you were to plot a characteristics this is v in dc versus the output you get at dc if you increase the input voltage you expect the output also to increase linearly right but now it will not be the case it will do something like this right so if i were to plot the v in dc versus the output code i get right ideally you are supposed to get a nice straight line like this of course it won't be a straight line with a particular uh, we'll get this guy which can be approximated as a straight line but in presence of non linearity this won't be linear okay we have to capture that effect and for that the only way is to say how uh, this non linear curve is deviating from the linear portion 
Is that fine? So uh, if you were to describe this quantizer characteristics in blue, what will be the information that will be needed? Or let us say I uh, phrase it in a different way. What will be the information that you will need to draw this quantizer characteristics? I mean, let's say I gave you the range. It's spanning from minus 1 volt to plus 1 volt and there are 8 codes. That is known. In addition to it, what is the information you will need to draw this characteristics? The transition voltage. So I can either specify the transition voltage VK or yeah, either I can specify these transition voltages or the code width for each code. That should be enough. So I can either do this delta K or the transition voltage. And remember that we are interested in saying how much this is deviating from the ideal characteristics. So instead of looking at delta K, what should I look at? Sorry? No, no, I mean we, both are same, right? I mean, let's say even even if I can describe the characteristics either using delta K or by VK. But I am not interested in just the characteristics. How it is deviating from the characteristics is what I am interested in. So instead of looking at delta K, what I should look at? I will just find out how it is deviating from the ideal. Similarly, instead of looking at VK, I look at how it is deviating from the ideal transition voltage. So let's say I call it VK ideal. And remember that in our case, this is K minus 4 times delta. Yeah, yeah. This K minus 4 delta is under the assumption that we have 8 levels. Okay. But uh, this is usually not good enough to capture it because let us say now I am operating this guy from minus 1 volt to plus 1 volt. I get some uh, delta case and some deviation. Now if I operate the same guy with minus 2 volt to plus 2 volt, these things will increase or decrease? Will delta increase or decrease? So the deviation will also increase. But yes, I mean both of them will increase, so the difference will also increase, right? But that doesn't mean that my quantizer is more nonlinear. It is just the same nonlinear characteristic. Just because I am uh, increasing this guy, it doesn't mean that my nonlinearity has increased. So instead of looking at this, we normalize it with respect to the ideal step size. Both these guys you normalize it, okay? So this is called the differential nonlinearity. Or the DNL. The second one is called the integral nonlinearity. Or the INL. Okay. So this is how we will uh, characterize the static nonlinearity of our ADC. Okay. And uh, do you think this DNL and INL will be related or not related? They should be related because they describe the same quantizer. There should be some relation and it is actually not that difficult to find. Yeah, let me write it here and do it. So INL of K is VK minus VK ideal which is K minus 4 times delta. My delta ideal and DNL of K this is delta K minus delta ideal right? and you can find that if I take INL of K plus 1 and INL of K and take the difference. So this for K plus 1 this will be VK plus 1. So we will get VK plus 1 minus VK. And uh, this portion will only get minus delta ideal. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So this is basically the code with delta k. So then this just becomes DNL. So I mean the converse is also true. Oops. Sorry. Let's see. Delta K, so this is DNL of K. The other way to say is my INL 
is an accumulated version of DNL. Right? And if I take the first difference of INL, I get DNL. So if I accumulate DNL, I should get back INL. Same thing. Great. So now uh, let's look at this characteristic and let's try to find the DNL of code 3. Again, uh, remember that this is basically the step code width for the particular code minus the ideal code width. Okay. And for, uh, let's say use this color, for code 3, what is the code width? 0. I mean, essentially in the characteristic, the code 3 is missing. Okay. So here, delta k is 0. So this will become minus 1. Okay. Right. So in general, if you have a DNL to be minus 1, and one more thing, you, I mean, strictly speaking, this guy is dimensionless. But in practice, we just say that this is so many LSBs. Okay. LSB is least significant bit. Okay. So if DNL is minus 1 LSB, it means that a particular code doesn't exist. So this indicates a missing code. Yeah, ideally everything must be 0. But if the code is entirely missing, the DNL will be minus 1. So that's why you want this uh, DNL to be within, you know, minus 1 to plus 1. Correct. Great. Now, uh, in practice, uh, besides this issue of having non-uniform code width for each code, uh, Why do you, have one as a maximum code? you think about it. Uh, if let us say DNL is more than two, you see what what might happen. It's a, I mean minus one means it's a missing code, but plus one doesn't mean it's missing code, but it's usually more the level of the required idea. Yeah, but that will mean that in some other in some other code, see if this is one code is spanning more than one LSB. It means that this must be the ideal step size. This guy is having twice that. So which means for some other code, it's going to reduce. Right. So usually we try to keep it to minus 1 to plus 1. It, usually if it's, it can be anything. But if you want it to be reasonably linear, we try to keep it like this. Now in practice, in addition to this issue of non-uniform code width, there are also a couple of uh, not so critical non-idealities and one such non-ideality is the uh, gain error. So again, uh, I am showing uh, the grey characteristic which is the ideal expected one and the blue is the one with uh, gain error. So the only difference is in the blue characteristic the code width for each code is equal that is uh, delta 1 is equal to delta 2. It is equal to some delta hat, but that is not equal to the ideal delta. Okay. But this doesn't mean that this characteristic is non-linear. Right? So if I try to fit a straight line, for the grey one I will get some straight line like this. For the blue one I might get some another straight line like this. The only difference is the slope of the straight line. Okay. So this just results in a gain error and this usually is not so critical because it can be easily corrected. So uh, if you try to calculate DNL with R definition, you will just say that it is delta k minus delta ideal by delta ideal and we will think that this is DNL is non-zero. So according to the definition as of now, it appears as though uh, our measure says that we have non-linearity, but although there is no non-linearity. So this has to be revised now. So how should the definition be revised? I mean, this should be 0, ideally. I mean, in this case, it should be 0. Because the characteristic is not non-linear. It is still linear, just that the gain has changed. No, I mean, every quantizer curve, I mean, every, this is, I, strictly speaking, it's a non-linear relation. But you can fit a straight line. I mean, is the point clear? This blue one is also linear. Just that the code width is different from the ideal code width. Okay. It is 
still linear. But if you try to find the DNL based on our current definition, you will find that the DNL is non-zero, which does not seem to be doing justice to the quantizer. So how should we revise the definition? This should be zero, right? So what should I change? Minus? Sorry? Yeah, we basically have to revise our step size. We will use this delta hat. Okay. So we cannot, we can no longer use the ideal code width. We will find an average code width for our characteristic. Then do. The graph delta is bigger than the delta. No, no, last delta it is not even defined. It is for infinite, right? You ideally will be 6 for the, we will come to that later. See, if you take a quantizer, this is how it is going to look like. Right? Yeah, yeah, I will come to that. No, no, delta 1, see, this is code 1, right? This is the code bit for code 1. Yeah, I will come to the delta average. So, what we mean by delta average is this. Now, even if you see how we got delta ideal, delta ideal was 0.25, right? And that we can think of it by, let us say, I look at these two endpoints. So, this is, let us say, minus 0.75 volt and this is point plus 0.75. In between these two, I will see how many codes I have, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. So, I can find the average uh, thing to be this 1.5 by 6 and that is what was giving 0.25. Now for a new characteristic, I will do the same thing. I will find the delta average as, I will first find uh, what this voltage is. Let us say that is something and the last voltage, let us say this is some 0.6. So in between these two, how many, uh, I mean I will find this range, let us say some V divided by 6. Okay. Still, I have six levels between those two. We will look at an example now that will make it clear. So, yeah. So, here I am showing a characteristic where I have both gain error and the non uniform code width. Okay. So, let us see how we will be uh, calculating. As I mentioned, the first step is to find the average code width, and that you do as follows you first find what are these end voltages. So, I have already marked it here. So, this is minus 0.625 and this is 0.525. So, the average step size is the difference between these two and how much is it? I think 1.15. Yeah. So, it is 1.15 by 6. This will be our average step size and once you have it, you can find the DNL. Okay. And again, you can show some quick things. If I show, let us say I find for each code k, delta k, let us say 0, 1, 2, now for code 0, if you see, as I just uh, mentioned before, the code width is not defined, right, because for the first code, any voltage from minus infinity to this minus 0.625 is quantized as code 0. So, the code width is ideally not defined. Okay. So, for this guy is usually not defined. So, here also it is not defined. Same is the case for the last code also. Even for the extreme uh, last code, any voltage from this to infinite is quantized to the last code. So, even for this guy the code width is not defined. So, DNL is not defined for the two extreme codes. And for the others you can find for the first code, the step size is this, that is basically difference between minus 0.5 and minus 0.625, so that is I think 0.125. So then you can find what is it, 0.125 minus delta average by delta average. And then you can keep doing it for all the other codes also. Okay. Great. So now, uh, in addition to this gain error, we will also have something called an offset error. Okay. 
So again, the one in gray is the ideal step characteristic, and one in blue is the one with offset. And here, the only difference is that the transition voltage is they are all offset from the ideal value by a constant, you know, amount. So again, this characteristic is still linear, just that the entire curve is shifted to the right or left by some offset voltage. Okay. And now, if you try to find INL. We usually define it like the transition voltage minus the ideal transition voltage by the average step size. Now this is the uh, ideal transition voltage. This is the actual transition voltage I have. So we might think that we have some difference, but of course that is not capturing the actual uh, performance. So if you calculate I INL like this, we'll get it to be non-zero. But doesn't mean that the characteristic is non-linear. So before computing INL or for that matter DNL, we'll have to remove the offset from the characteristic. Okay. So in practice, we'll have all of them. So here I'm showing a characteristic where we have both offset. I mean all offset, gain error, and non-linearities. That will be right. I mean, I have made this characteristic, so I know. And in practice, you do not know, right? So what you should ideally do? I mean, there are a couple of ways in which it can be done. Right. You can just put it non -linear, yeah. Can there could be offset. There could be gain error. Looking just by looking at it, you cannot say. But you have to subtract the offset before you compute INL. That's the point. So what you do in practice is one way is you take this guy. And try to fit a line which is let us say y not plus some k one y. Okay. And then you find what is the best fit parameters for these two. So this will give the offset, and this will give the gain. Once you find the offset, you subtract the offset from the characteristic. So subtract the offset, and from k one you can find what is the delta average. And then you can calculate what is the DNL and INL. Is that okay? The bottom line is you have to first correct the offset and gain error before you calculate the nonlinearities, because these two do not say that my characteristic is nonlinear. Okay. And this is one way in which uh, the. Why don't No delta uh, for offset, right? I mean, this is let us say one characteristic. The other one is offset like this. These two. But this transition voltage might also shift because of nonlinearity. I mean, see, in practice, the ideally this is the transition voltage. In this is the new transition voltage. This shift can be either due to offset or due to nonlinearity. You do not know what is what. So, okay. Correct. See, there are two ways in which it can be done. This is one way, and this is the IEEE definition. There is another way. I don't. I don't want to explain it because it's okay. We'll not use it now. Okay. But think about it. What you mentioned will not work. Okay. Great. So uh, now we uh, saw that the quantizer characteristics or the nonlinearity in the quantizer can be characterized using. DNL and INL, and remember we were also measuring the nonlinearity through the signal to noise and distortion ratio. So, do you think uh, these two guys should be related or not related? They should be related because finally everything is capturing the nonlinearity of the same quantizer. I mean, there is some relation. I mean, of course, it's not uh, straightforward to find out, but there is relation. Okay, great. So. 
yeah so now you might have i mean hopefully have some idea at the top level understanding of an adc and how you can characterize the performance of an adc so at this stage you should be able to open a data sheet of an adc and understand what most of the specifications mean and uh, you know what specification is relevant for your application so that you can choose an appropriate adc okay so that covers the system level aspects so now from this point we'll get into the circuit design aspects of the adc ah uh. No, no. I mean, you can see you are saying the input is spanning some instead of taking the entire range, it is spanning a small range. Let us say, you can, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so basically, in that case, you can do something like this, and then uh, say this is. But yeah, this can be done. Yeah. No, it is still red. This is still uniform code width. But if you try to have non-uniform code width, that is not great because you are inherently adding distortion there. But this is better. Why is it better? No, no. If you are again, see, if your input range is small, you define your quantizer characteristic within that range. No, no, no. Okay, suppose. Right. That's okay. So you are saying why don't we have a non-uniform step width, right? Is that your? Yeah, but how are you saying that? Why? Why do you want to give more uh, voltage range for one code and less voltage range for another code? Because I know that my voltage is more. There's more information that. Yeah, yeah, but uh, information is also there in the quantized. Uh, code right see the moment you do this the moment you, you have in, uh, intentionally you are having non uniform code width that is introducing non linearity so if you are having a sinusoidal signal the output spectrum will not be clean if you are okay with that you can do this but this is not a common practice think about it you can try it in matlab and check out you will find that if you do this where you have non uniform code width and if you are applying a sinusoidal signal You'll find that at the output you'll have a lot of distortion. Again, if for a, for your application, if that is okay, fine. But this is not a common thing to do. Okay, you can try it in MATLAB. It doesn't take so much time. Great. So now let's start to look at uh, the circuit design of ADC. Let's start with the first operation. And what's the first operation? Sampling. So let's see how we'll be sampling a signal. So I'm sure you might know. Have a switch that opens or closes, and to save the sample signal, you use a capacitor, right? And the switch is controlled by a clock, say phi. And let's say this clock signal phi does something like this. Now let us say I want the signal to be sampled at a rate f s, which is one by t s. What should be the, what should this clock period be? T s. Okay. 
and again the uh, thing is if the clock signal is low the switch is open and when the clock is high the switch is closed right so let's say this is the input signal this is phi this is input and let me mark these instance quickly so uh, in this phase the switch is closed so what will happen to the output output is shorted to the input so the output will track the input like this and once the switch is open what will happen the capacitor will hold that voltage and once again when the switch is closed it will start to track the input like this and once the switch opens it will do like this and uh, here what are the time instants at which the signal is getting uh, which is increasing okay okay so here what are the time instants at which the signal is getting sampled in, with respect to the clock i have drawn here at which point in this clock at which points in this clock the signal is getting sampled no no i mean i have not marked time instance right falling edge okay because when the signal i mean when this clock is high we are tracking and the voltage across the capacitor is frozen when you open the switch so the falling edges define the sampling instance okay so let's say i can call this now as time instant t equal to 0 the next falling edge can be treated as fine right and you see that when the switch is actually closed the output tracks the input and when the switch is open it's holding it so this is often called the track and hold and usually we give half the time period for tracking and half the time period for holding okay okay why is that so think about it that's a rookie mistake just think about it. i mean here in this case at least the moment i close the switch there's a short so capacitor voltage will track the input we'll discuss about that uh, later you think about it under what conditions the capacitor voltage cannot change instantly think about it we'll see next class but this is clear i mean now i close the switch the output is shorted to the input so output will follow the input that's all if the input changes suddenly the output will also change suddenly okay yeah okay great and once you have basically sampled it you can uh, take the signal and directly quantize it or as we'll see uh, in our course most of the times we do some processing before we quantize it okay great and uh, here to finish the circuit we already know what a capacitor is the only thing pending is the switch what is the simplest switch you know a mosfet so you can use a mosfet like this now remember when i when when i draw it like this this is an ideal switch so it means when i close the switch there is a short from input to the output so the resistance is literally zero and similarly when i open the switch the resistance is infinite but a mosfet is far from an ideal switch so we'll consider uh, all non idealities non idealities associated with the mosfet and see how we'll tackle them in practice okay and what is the first non ideality that comes to your mind the on resistance of the mosfet right so what we'll do first we'll understand what will happen if you have a finite on resistance and then we'll see what is the on resistance of a mosfet and see how we can design switches using a mos so first i'll consider finite on resistance and uh, as i mentioned earlier so usually after sampling a lot of processing is done before we quantize so in practice uh, let's say this is the continuous time signal the first stage will sample it 
uh, let's say we do some processing on this. Say we do some processing on this. And this processing can be done in multiple stages, right? So let's say this is the first stage. And then you have one more stage here. The second stage will again sample this guy. And then do some processing. So the point I'm uh, getting to what is, the switches used in our circuits can see two kinds of signals. One is a continuously varying signal like this. That will be seen by switches used in the front end of sampling. Whereas the switches used in the successive stages, they might not see a continuously varying signal because this guy has already sampled it. So you'll see some kind of a held signal like this. Okay. The signal is varying over time, but when the switch is closed, during the time period for which the switch is closed, the signal doesn't change because you have already sampled and held it. Is that okay? So in practice, the switches can see uh, either a continuously varying signal or a constant or a held signal. So we'll consider the effects of this finite on resistance for the two cases. And first I'll consider a case where we are dealing with the held or a constant signal. And that's basically some DC. Fine. And the finite on resistance can be modeled as having an ideal switch and a resistor in series. So, capacitor. So, let's say the switch is closed at t equal to 0. This is, let us say, t equal to 0. If, if the on resistance was 0, the output will immediately track the input. Something like this. This is if on resistance was 0. An ideal switch. I'll, I will do at the end of the class. Huh? We will definitely explain. See, but uh, now, I mean, see, if the on resistance is 0, at least it should be clear that there is a short, right? The output will follow the input. Simple KCL, KVL. Yeah, yeah, you will see. I will explain that at the end. Remember it, I will explain at the end, okay? But with the finite on resistance, what will happen to the output? It cannot change instantly. So we'll do something like this. And what is the, uh, if I call the capacitor voltage as V out, what is V out of T? R on C. Okay. And remember that when the switch is operated, the control signal is going to do this and uh, the switch will be active for a time period of Ts by 2. So if I look at the sample V out of n, write it at the bottom, to find the sample what is the time T I should look at? Ts by 2, right? So at Ts by 2, I will have V0 okay. So this I can write it as the ideal voltage V0 minus an error signal okay. And if you want the error signal to be small, what should I do? I should increase RC or decrease RC? I should decrease RC. So you choose the time constant R on C to be much much smaller than TS by 2. And how much smaller is dependent on your requirement, how accurately you want the output to settle. Right? So this is the case with a held signal. So now let's look at what happens if you have a time varying signal. And for a time varying signal, I'll take a sinusoid because any signal can be decomposed as sinusoids. So let's say this is some cos omega naught t. I have the same setup R and C. And let's say the switch is closed at t equal to 0. So what will happen to the output? How will the output look like? Hmm? 
Okay, I mean at least uh, hopefully it is clear that in steady state, what will be the output? You have a sinusoid at a frequency omega naught, and what is the transfer function from V in to V out? Yeah, you can find it. It's one by j omega c by whatever r plus one by j omega c. So that's j omega c. So basically, the magnitude of the sinusoid will be scaled by this magnitude and delayed by the phase. But that's only the steady state part. You'll also have a transient portion. So we can work it out. So we'll have some transient portion. And the transient portion, will it increase or decrease? Till discharge. And how will it discharge? Till discharge exponentially as again minus t by tau. Plus you will have the steady state portion, which is highlighted here, v in 0. The magnitude will be scaled by the magnitude of the transfer function. And you'll also have a phase. Fine. Great. So again, uh, if I were to look at the sample, I'll uh, put T as T S by two. So now I see that I have one transient portion which is decaying, and if I choose my time constant, which is around C, to be much much smaller than T S by two, you can basically ignore this guy. This will decay to zero. It's an exponential decay. But you also see that here the in steady state the magnitude and phase of the sinusoid are different. So if you want the magnitude to be same as the input magnitude, what should you do? How should you choose? I mean this factor should be smaller than 1 or larger than 1? Much smaller than 1. So I will choose omega naught r on c to be much much smaller than 1. So again that says r on c to be smaller than 1 by omega naught. I mean this should also be clear if you look at the Bode plot. So if I look at the Bode plot of the transfer function, so it will do something like this and the corner is 1 by RC. So I will have to make sure that my input signal frequency is lying somewhere here. The maximum frequency I am interested in must lie well before the cutoff of the RC. Only then I will get the same magnitude. Right? Great. So now uh, this gives some understanding. We have to choose our time constant R on C, either based on this guy or this guy, whichever is stricter in your case. And once that is done, as we will see, uh, so you will find R on C from this, based on either of these two conditions. And then as we will see, we will find the capacitor from the noise requirements. And from that you can find what is the uh, maximum on resistance you can have. Okay, great. So now we'll look at uh, MOSFET and see what is the on resistance it has. So let's say I take an NMOS. So to turn the switch off, what should be the gate voltage I should apply? 0. Remember this should be much less than threshold voltage to turn it off and this will be operating in cutoff. And to turn it on, I should apply, I will apply the maximum gate voltage and if this is V in, what will V out approximately be? It is a switch. So if the input is V in, no, no, why? Is it fine? I mean, it's a, so approximately it should be V in. Even if it's not ideal, roughly it is V in, right? So then, what is drain to source voltage? So what region it is operating in? It's operating in linear region. And in linear region, uh, what is the current? We have VGS minus VTH. We also have VDS square by 2. Okay. But uh, yeah, since our VDS is very small, I can neglect this guy. And before that, again, uh, I'm just reminding that the clock signal for the NMOS will look like this. 
going from 0 to VDD. Fine. So here from this current equation you can find the on resistance or I can first find the on conductance as d i d s by d v d s and uh, that's basically mu n c ox w by l fine so basically the on resistance is inverse of this mu on c ox w by l and when the switch is on what is the gate voltage gate voltage is v d d and source voltage is approximately v in so VGS is basically VDD minus V in. Fine. Great. So let me copy this. So if I try to plot the on resistance as a function of the input voltage. How will it look like? Yeah, it's a it, it's a reasonably good switch. I mean, if it's an ideal switch, V out is exactly V in. If it's a reasonably good switch, it will be approximately equal to V in. This is an approximation. Right. Okay, I mean. We will assume that, see, you are saying that, okay, where is this, we will take here, this guy, this capacitor, once it is charged, we will dump this charge to somewhere else so that it can be quantized. So capacitor will be will lose its charge, okay, so we will have to resample it again. I mean your question is if its capacitor is already charged to V in, why should it charge to new value, right? Two aspects, one, the capacitor can lose charge. 2 the input can change, if the input is changing again you will have to sample it right, is that okay? So here yeah if I were to plot the on resistance versus V in how will it look like? I mean if you have Y equal to 1 by X, so look like this. So here I have Y is some K minus X something, so it will basically look like this. Okay. And where will it go to infinity? What value of V in the on resistance tends to infinite? And that should also be clear if I look at the circuit. If I apply VDD minus VDH and the gate is VDD. The gate source voltage is one threshold, so it will not you know ideally conduct. But in practice, if you apply, let us say, even VDD, what will be the maximum value to which the capacitor will charge to? Yeah, I mean, uh, if the capacitor, if it's initially discharged, we have maximum VGS, current will flow, capacitor voltage will increase, and ideally, once it reaches VDD minus VTHN, the gate to source voltage is one threshold, the current should be zero, so it will stop there. But in practice, you will have sub threshold conduction. So, even if VGS is less than VTH, current will start flowing and eventually the voltage will reach to VDD. Okay. But of course, this is not something you want. It will take, it will take longer time, that is all. Okay, so, from here, it is clear that uh, I cannot use a mo NMOS as a switch for voltages close to this range. right? So, as long as I am restricting my input voltage to a small ranges of voltages. This can be used. Yeah, I will come to that. So, basically, uh, NMOS is a good switch if you have, I'll say, low values of in. And uh, even if you have low values of in, let us say I restrict my input to this range. If the input voltage varies, what can you say about the on resistance? On resistance also varies, right? And note that my on resistance is a nonlinear function of the input. Okay. So we'll move to the next page. So my R on I know it's a nonlinear function of the input. 
and uh, we just saw that if you give a time varying sinusoidal signal to our switch the output in steady state had an amplitude like this right and here my r on is a non linear function of input so what will happen to the output so my output will also be a non linear function of the input so if i if the input is a sinusoid at the output if i look at the spectrum what will i observe i'll i'll observe all harmonics of it so this directly results in non linear okay so this means if you take a nmos capacitor and you apply a sinusoid and even if the sinusoidal amp sinusoid amplitude is small if i look at the output samples there will be distortion here but if you have a constant or a held input which is again uh, what kind of non linearity can work for this is basically r on is 1 by vdd minus v in right so you can basically it's also in square root so we'll have all harmonics actually so let's say you have an held input uh, this issue is not so critical because if you have a constant input remember that the error was something like e power minus ts by 2rc right and uh, for a held input although the signal amplitude changes over some cycle to cycle when the switch is on in one particular clock period the signal doesn't change so the on resistance in that period is constant but although the on resistance will keep changing cycle to cycle okay and the error you incur is basically like this so if you choose my uh, if you choose here r on to be reasonably small enough because of the fact that this is exponential function the error will easily decay to zero but that won't be the case for a sinusoid because here you have this 1 by square root of 1 plus omega square rc square this will be a much stronger non linearity than this guy because this decays to zero quickly okay so the bottom line you can use an nmos which if you have a constant or a held signal which is low for small values of such signals you can use it and uh, just to remind you the on resistance is 1 by mu n c ox w by l v d d minus v in minus v t h right so remember that this mu n c ox is not under your control this guy is also not under your control the only thing that can be changed to get the required on resistance is w by l so how will you choose your length you want a small on resistance or a large on resistance so how will you choose the length to be the smallest possible right so you choose the minimum possible length in your process for the length and you can choose the width appropriately okay. so for any switch which one yeah we'll see what will happen but the point is there is no point in choosing a non minimum length if you are using a mosfet as a switch okay. right i mean uh, now we notice nmos is not working well for large values of vn one thing you can do in practice is this so let's say this is nmos if the input is vdd the switch is not working because the gate voltage right now is also vdd that is not enough to turn the switch on so let's say i choose some signal vdd hat which is greater than vd right and give my gate signal to be going from 0 to vdd hat then this will turn on so this is usually called gate boosting and uh, this can be done in some cases but not possible in all cases because you might not have access to voltages greater than supply so uh, usually the use of nmos switches is in cases where you are dealing with constant small signals okay now uh, similarly if you have pmos switch it just the dual of this so for a pmos switch to keep the switch off what should i apply to the gate 
we need it remember that for a pmos if source to gate is less than mod vthp it is off okay and to turn it on what will be the gate voltage i'll apply zero okay and uh, for an nmos ideally the clock signal was going like this so when the clock signal was zero for an nmos it was off this is on but now to keep the switch off what should the signal be applied to pmos be ready so i should apply an inverted burst on the clock i'll call it five bar so i'll apply five bar here right and again if you look at the on resistance it will just be similar new pc ox w by l into vsg minus mod vthp so here uh, when the switch is on what is the gate voltage i mean when the switch is on what is the source to gate voltage source is v in gate is zero so source to gate voltage is v in and again here if you want to choose uh, an on i mean if you want to design the switch you have minimum width minimum length possible and you can choose the width appropriately and if you sketch the on resistance as a function of input voltage it'll just basically be a shifted hyperbola like this so this is a good switch for high values of input the same arguments hold good as for nmos so now we have one switch working good for low inputs one more switch for high inputs so we basically combine the two and get a cmos switch this also called transmission gate so here i'll take a pmos and then nmos in parallel like this for turning for turning on the nmos i'll apply a clock 5 for pmos it should be the complement then so let's uh, quickly look at the on resistance of this so the overall on resistance what will it be it will be parallel of these two so e easier thing is to find the on conductance which will be the sum of the conductances of the two so i'll write it here maybe so the conductance will be for nmos it's mu and c ox w by l of the nmos times vd minus v in minus vdhn for pmos it is uh, mu pc ox w by lp v in minus mod vthp so here if i choose let us say mu and c ox w by l n to be equal to mu pc ox w by lp yeah so you see that if uh, these two guys are equal this v in term will get cancelled right so the on conductance will simply be some beta times vdd is it okay so this solves our problems because now you see that the on resistance is no longer a function of the input so it means even if the signal is varying ideally speaking there should be no distortion and again if you look at the uh, graph it might be slightly clear if i plot the on resistance versus the input voltage for the nmos it was doing something like this for the pmos it was doing something like this if you put these two in parallel ideally you expect the resistance is constant but in practice this never works simply because you can't size the transistors to satisfy this because there is a lot of variation in both mu and up you can't exactly estimate what that value is and size appropriately and uh, second thing is here i have drawn the mosfets with three terminals but ideally how many terminals a mosfet has four right so the body terminal is there for a pmos in mo, uh, you can always connect the body terminal to the source but in most processes the nmos body terminal 
cannot be independently connected to any potential you want. You connect it to the lowest potential possible in your circuit, which is the ground. So in this case, if this is input, remember that this is also approximately input. For the NMOS, what is the source to bulk voltage? V in. Okay. And if the source to bulk voltage changes, what will change? Threshold voltage will change. So in this guy, this will be a function of input. That will introduce further dependence. And even if not that, I mean, even a more fundamental thing is, you say, it, it, it is possible in practice to connect these two. I mean, ideally, if you don't want this body effect, you want to keep source to bulk voltage to be zero. In, in, in practice, because of the way the CMOS processes are, you don't have the provision in many cases to do that. In practice, you cannot do it because uh, all the NMOS body will be same. It is a common piece of state. Yeah. So the, uh, another reason is simply speaking, this entire equation is very approximate, right? Because we this uh, all based on the assumption that our ID versus VDS relation is something for uh, you know in linear region that itself is crudely inaccurate. So we'll have further dependence on the input voltage in the on resistance. So in practice, if you plot the on resistance, it won't be a constant like this. We'll have some variations like this. So the bottom line, if you have an NMOS, it is a very good switch as long as the input is held or constant and the input value is low, thin quotes. If you have a PMOS switch, it is very good again for a held or constant signal for high values. If you have a CMOS switch, it is a good switch for held or constant signals for full range of uh, V in from 0 to VDD. It can take any you know, input voltage. And even if the signal is time varying to a first order, there is very small dependence on input voltage. The on resistance is uh, not so strongly dependent on the input voltage. So you can use it with limited linearity. Okay. But in practice, uh, we will be requiring linearities greater than let us say 90 dB or 100 dB or so. In those cases, this might not work. Great. So yeah, probably I will stop here and we will continue the next class.